What we want to do today uh, is explore the annotation of regulatory features uh, and how to find information about those features in the Ensemble Genome Browser. So within Ensemble, um, we annotate the genome with functional regulatory elements, um, which typically consist of features such as promoters, uh, enhancers and repressors. We do this for two different species, so we only do this for human and mouse. So really the focus of this webinar um, is for those people who are studying human and mouse data. Um, as you'll see towards the end of the presentation, uh, we do have plans in the future to extend um, this type of analysis and this, this data type um, to other species, but at the moment um, we only have data for human and mouse at the moment. So to annotate these regulatory features uh, for human and mouse, uh, Ensemble incorporates data um, concerning a number of different types, uh, a number of different type of, of um, genetic features. So we look at um, epigenetic marks. So we look uh, at data concerning histone modifications uh, and DNA methylation across the genome. We also look to see the pattern of transcription factor uh, and RNA polymerase binding. Uh, and finally, we also look at the pattern of open and closed chromatin uh, across the genome as well. And we use this, um, we use data, we use experimental evidence of these different phenomena uh, to try and annotate these regulatory features across the genome. So the importance of gene regulation, um, the, the expression of genes, uh, the expression of gene, regu the regulation of gene expression, sorry, um, can be example of, uh, can be demonstrated very simply through the hematopoietic stem cell lineage. So if we think about um, blood cells in general, um, we know that the blood um, contains many different cell types. Uh, and in fact, these cell types are all derived from a single hematopoietic progenitor cell, uh, stem cell. So uh, in fact, all of the cell types, the, derm the, the terminally differentiated cell types within blood, they all have the same genome and the same repertoire of genes, um, but they are all very morphologically different uh, and they all have a very distinct uh, functions and phenotypes. Uh, and obviously the reason for the difference in the the, dif the reason for the differences in these terminally differentiated cells uh, is the fact that they express a different set of genes. Um, so they have different gene expression profiles. Um, you might hear this um, commonly called an epigenome. So the, an epigenome is just a gene expression profile uh, and different cells will express a different set of genes at different levels uh, at different times. Uh, and so they, they, they therefore have different epigenomes. So one of the types of data that Ensemble incorporates uh, into the annotation um, of regulatory features um, is the underlying epigenetic state uh, of the DNA in, in any particular region of the genome. Uh, and epigenetics can be thought about as the study of heritable genetic changes that do not directly, that, that are not, um, that are independent of, of the sequence of the DNA itself. Um, and these, actually, these changes that are, not regulate, that are not involved in the DNA sequence changes are also known to regulate gene expression. Now, there are two different branches um, of epigenetics. The first is DNA methylation. Um, so we know that the DNA uh, itself is made up of um, four separate bases, A's, T's, G's, and C's. Uh, and within the DNA sequence, there might be regions that are rich uh, in CG repeats. Uh, these are called CPG islands. Um, and the cytosines, um, the cytosine bases themselves, they can be covalently modified with methyl groups. Uh, and this pattern of attachment of methyl to the cytosine uh, bases within the DNA uh, can regulate gene expression. The other type, the other branch of epigenetics uh, is the modification of histones. Uh, so DNA is wound around um, proteins called histones. Um, and these proteins, the histone proteins themselves, they can be post-translationally modified um, with many different types of modifications, such as um, methylate, methyl groups, methylation, uh, acetyl groups, ubiquitin, sumoylation. Uh, and this pattern of post-translational modification uh, can also affect the, the expression of the genes uh, in, that, in that area where that histone is located. So I just want to take a look at these two branches of epigenetics in a little bit more detail. Uh, so let's have a first look at the histone modification. So the histone complex uh, is actually made up of eight different proteins. So um, there's four. It's a homo. Uh, there's four different homodimers, 
Um, so there's four separate proteins, one called H2A, one called H2B, uh, there's H3 and H4. So together, uh, the homodimers of these four proteins form the, the histone optima, uh, and the DNA is wound around that, um, that complex. Now, the individual histone proteins are quite globular, um, but the N-terminal tail of these proteins um, does extend away from the complex, and they can be post -trans the residues within that N-terminal tail can be post-translationally modified. So we have a particular nomenclature system for describing um, post-translational modifications of histone tails. So you can see this at the bottom here. Um, we always first refer to the histone. So we have H3 in this case, which is this uh, histone protein here in green. Then we refer to the residue. So in this case, we're talking about lysine 36. Uh, and then finally, we, re we refer to the post-translational modification itself. So in this case, we're looking at trimethylation of lysine 36 in histone 3. Uh, and that's what we can see here. So this is the methylation. Uh, in this example, we're trimethylation of lysine 36 uh, of histone 3. Now, the pattern uh, of histone uh, post-translational modification is known to regulate gene expression. Um, and different post-translational modifications are associated with either an upregulation or a downregulation of gene expression in that genomic region. Um, now, and this is known as the histone code. Now, the pattern of gene expression, the actual level of gene expression that's observed, will obviously be the result of the combination of, of, of all of the different post-translational modifications that are observed uh, in a genomic region at, at a particular time. Um, but obviously, it will also be the result um, of other factors such as DNA methylation, transcription factor binding, uh, and the pattern of open and closed chromatin as well. So this is obviously just one part um, of the complex machinery that's involved in regulating gene expression. But generally what we see is that some of these modifications are associated with a positive regulation of gene expression and some of them uh, negatively affect gene expression. So as you can see here, um, monomethylation of lysine 4 of histone 3 is generally associated with an increase uh, of gene expression, whereas uh, trimethylation um, of lysine 9 of histone 3, for example, is associated with the downregulation of gene expression. The other branch of epigenetics um, that we wanted to think about was DNA methylation. So I just want to explain this using a, a quick diagram. So we can think of uh, a region in our genome here, which is uh, in, dark, in dark blue. Uh, then we have our gene here in red, uh, and we have an upstream region uh, in the light blue. So this region is upstream this uh, of our gene of interest. Uh, and when we look at this sequence, we can see that there are regions within this sequence that I have these CG repeats that I mentioned earlier. So these are the CPG islands. So the cytosines within these CPG islands can be selectively methylated um, by an enzyme called DNA methyltransferase. Uh, and in my example here, you can see that all of the cytosines in my CPG islands have been methylated. Um, but what you'll actually find is that there will be some cytosines uh, that have been um, that have had the uh, that have been methylated, uh, and some cytosines that haven't. What we also know is obviously that DNA is double-stranded, um, and so a CG on one strand is a CG on the other strand, uh, on the reverse strand, based on reverse complementarity. Uh, and so the pattern of methylation is actually conserved uh, from the forward to the reverse strand. What we also know um, is that the methylation um, of CPG islands um, is associated with transcriptional inactivity, so a reduction of the level of gene expression. Uh, and this is because the transcription factors uh, and RNA polymerase that are required to bind to the DNA to, to activate the expression of a gene um, are unable to, to access the binding motifs within the DNA. So when the methyl groups have been removed, as we can see here, for example, uh, the transcription factors are able to access the transcription factor binding motifs to recruit RNA polymerase, uh, which leads to an upregulation of gene expression. So what we can do is we can analyze the pattern of methylation uh, across a genome um, using a technique called bisulfite sequencing. So you can see here my uh, example stretch of DNA, uh, which is 
um, which is methylated in some regions and, and unmethylated in others. What we then do is we treat our genome, we treat our genomic sequence with uh, a, chemical, a chemical called bisulfite. Uh, and bisulfite converts unmethylated cytosines to uracils. So as you can see here, there are cytosines here which are unmethylated, here and here, for example, as well as here and here. Uh, and the bisulfite treatment converts these cytosines to uracils. However, the methylated cytosines, as you can see here and here and here, uh, these are protected from the bisulfite treatment by the methyl groups. Uh, and so the cytosine base remains uh, following the, the bisulfite treatment. What we can then do is sequence this genome, sequence this genomic sequence, um, and compare it to the reference to work out where the uracils now exist. Uh, and we can then infer the, the pattern of methylation across the genome. One of the other things um, that I wanted to think about was the um, binding uh, of transcription factors to promoters and enhancers. Now, obviously, the, the ability of, of transcription factors to bind to promoters and enhancers uh, is dependent upon histone modification, uh, histone post translational modification, uh, and DNA methylation. Um, but we want to think about the, the pattern of, of transcription factor binding in a bit more detail. So just going back to the cartoon that we had before, where we had a geno genomic sequence where, with a gene of interest in this region, uh, we've got this upstream flanking region. Uh, and what we all know uh, is that RNA polymerase is required to bind uh, upstream of the gene, and then it moves along the genome, transcribing um, the uh, mRNA which obviously leads to an upregulation of gene expression. But RNA polymerase is not the only player here. Uh, in fact, what's, what's required is the binding of a transcription factor complex uh, in a promoter region um, of the gene. So in this upstream region called the promoter, these transcription factors are required to, to bind, uh, which recruits RNA polymerase. Now, these transcription factors, they might bind directly to the DNA. Uh, there might be motifs within the DNA uh, that the transcription factors recognize and bind to, um, or the transcription factors might bind to one another. So as you can see here, um, this yellow and pink transcription factor are bound directly to motifs within the DNA, whereas this um, blue um, transcription factor here is forming a complex by binding to the other transcription factors. As well as the RNA polymerase uh, and the transcription factors at the promoters, there are also more distally um, located features called enhancers. So enhancers bind their own repertoire of transcription factors. So you can see this here, uh, there's a transcription factor bound to the enhancer. Um, and this actually leads to a 3D um, remodeling of the DNA, which brings the proteins, the transcription factors bound to the promoters and the enhancers together to form a transcription factor complex. Uh, and this transcription factor complex that's bound to the promoter's enhancers uh, then recruits the RNA polymerase uh, leading to the expression um, of our gene of interest. So what we know is that transcription factor binding at the promoters and the enhancers is necessary for transcription. Uh, and it's the combination of epigenetic marks. So the modification, the post-translational modification of histones uh, and the DNA methylation pattern that uh, affects the ability and the probability of the transcription factors to recognize and bind their motifs and bind the, the promoters and enhancers. So there's a, uh, an experimental technique that we can use for uh, analyzing the pattern of histone modification and transcription factor binding across the genome. Uh, it's called ChIP-seq. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but I just want to very quickly summarize the, the main um, points of, of this technique. So firstly, we take our sample. So this is going to include DNA, which uh, has a number of different proteins bound to it. These proteins might be transcription factors or histones uh, in, in the case of looking at these um, specific binding patterns. What we can then do is we chemically cross-link uh, these proteins to the DNA. Uh, and then we can mechanically shear the genome into small fragments. So um, the proteins will still be bound um, via this covalent bond here that we um, generated in this first step. Um, and the protein will have a small fragment of DNA bound to it. So you can see here um, many 
fragments of DNA will not have any proteins bound, they might be um, fractionated away, uh, and then we have these proteins uh, of interest bound to our fragments. What we can then do um, is use an antibody to specifically bind our protein of interest. Now, antibodies can be generated to bind very specifically to a protein of interest. So the antibody might bind to the transcription factor that we're interested in, um, or we could even generate an antibody that binds to a histone that's modified, post-translation modified in a specific way. So we could generate an antibody um, that binds to trimethylated lysine 36 of histone 3, for example. So we use our antibody to bind this protein uh, and obviously uh, with the associated DNA fragment. Then we can retrieve the small DNA fragment from the antibody protein complex uh, and then sequence these fragments and align them to the genome. So once these small fragments have been sequenced, as we can see here, we can align these fragments um, to, the, to the reference genome and work out where these proteins were bound uh, originally in the sequence. The final, um, the final thing that I want to think about before we move on to looking at the ensemble data um, is the pattern of open and closed chromatin. So as we mentioned before, the DNA is wound around histones um, and the histones themselves are then packed to form um, chromatin. So this condenses the, the chroma, this condenses the DNA into our chromatin uh, and allows it to all be packaged nicely up inside the nucleus. Now the pattern um, of of chromatin condensation um, is, is actually not uniform across the genome. So what we find here is that there are regions of closed chromatin, like we can see here, so the um, histone complexes with the DNA associated with them are very uniformly and tightly packed. And um, this is called closed chromatin. Uh, and then there are regions of open chromatin. So you can see here, for example, there is uh, a much weaker association um, of the histones to one another. So there might be um, gaps between the histones. Um, and this, these areas of open chromatin are associated with uh, transcriptional activity. So closed chromatin uh, is associated with a reduction of gene expression and open chromatin is associated with uh, an increase in gene expression. So obviously the, the DNA is much more accessible for the transcription factors and the RNA polymerase to bind to their motifs uh, leading to transcriptional activity. So we can assay the pattern of open and closed chromatin across a genome using a technique called DNA's hypersensitivity. So what we can do uh, is we take our genome, we take our sample and we treat it with an enzyme called DNA's 1. Now this enzyme will restrict uh, the DNA. Um, obviously it will restrict much more quickly. Uh, the enzymatic reaction will occur much more quickly uh, where the DNA is, uh, where the substrate, the DNA, uh, is more readily accessible. So what we can see here is that this region of open chromatin uh, is very quickly restricted by the DNA's enzyme, whereas the region of closed chromatin here uh, is restricted at a much slower rate by the DNA's enzyme. What we can then do is we can fractionate um, these different uh, regions away from one another based on the molecular weight. So these short DNA fragments will be very light uh, and then these protein associated fragments uh, of closed chromatin will be very heavy. So we can fractionate these two um, separate regions away from one another. We can sequence these short fragments uh, and then compare them to the reference. So we can work out which regions are associated uh, with open conformation and which regions are associated with a closed conformation. So this slide aims just to summarize um, what we've been covering in the first um, half of this webinar. So what you can see here is um, this diagram tries to represent all of these different layers uh, of transcriptional regulation. So you can see here, for example, we have the, the chromatin um, uh, and we might have regions of open chromatin that you can see here. We have an individual histone with the DNA wound around it. So this, the proteins in this histone might be um, post-translationally modified. We also have um, methyl groups being attached to the DNA itself. Uh, and then we have the binding of RNA polymerase and the other transcription factors uh, that will obviously lead to um, the transcription of mRNA. 
Now, molecular biologists have a toolbox of techniques that allow them to, to analyze um, these different patterns of, uh, of transcriptional regulation across the genome. And we've covered some of these um, in the first half of the, of the lecture. Um, but just to summarize them even more so, um, the hypersensitive sites, these uh, regions of open chromatin, uh, as well as the DNA seq that we spoke about, you can also analyze that using uh, techniques called fair seq or attack seq. We can look at the pattern of transcription factor binding uh, and histone post translation modification using chip seq, as we discussed. We can look at the pattern of um, methylation using bisulfite sequencing. So we have whole genome bisulfite sequencing or reduced representation bisulfite sequencing. Uh, you can also use methyl arrays to, to assay this, uh, this pattern across the genome. Then when we're looking at um, when we're looking at the uh, activity of RNA polymerase, uh, we can use RNA-seq uh, as well as ClipSeq and RibSeq as well. So these are uh, a wide array of techniques that um, scientists use to assay the layers of transcriptional regulation across the genome. So what I want to focus on in the second half of the lecture um, is the ensemble regulatory build. So I want to think about how uh, ensemble takes data from all of these different experimental techniques that are generated by lots of different labs and consortium around the world and processes that data to annotate the regulatory features. So just to quickly summarize the ensemble regulatory build, the annotation of regulatory features in ensemble. Step one um, is, to is the process data is imported from various sources. So there's a number of different research groups and collaborations around the world um, that take this um, raw data, they process it uh, and um, we, well, we process it, uh, they process it and we import it into Ensemble. This data is processed to predict um, the positions of the regulatory features. So we take all the data, we align it to the genome, we look to see where these um, regions, where histones are modified, where transcription factors are binding, and we use that evidence to annotate the, the position of these features, such as promoters, promoter flanking regions, enhancers, CTCF binding sites, regions of open chromatin as well. Step three is to look um, at the activity of these cell types, uh, sorry, to look at the activity of these features in a number of different cell types. So across the different cell types that we have data for, we predict whether these regulatory features are either active inactive, poised, or repressed. So we give an activity state for each feature in each cell type based on the underlying evidence. Uh, and then finally, we display uh, all this data in the genome browser, uh, and that's what we're going to be focusing on uh, in the demonstration, retrieving this data from the browser. So just at the bottom here, you can see I've provided links for the documentation that explains the ensemble regulatory build in more detail. Uh, and we also have um, a publication here that you can read in your own time that also explains the ensemble regulatory build and the resources we have. So the data comes from a number of different sources. So as I mentioned, we're only processing data for human and mouse at the moment. Um, so for human, we draw data from the ENCODE, the Roadmap Epigenomics and the Blueprint Epigenomics Project. So the ENCODE and the Roadmap Epigenomics Project looked at 48 different cultured cell lines uh, and they generated um, evidence, they generated data using ChIP-seq, looking at histone modifications, they looked at transcription factor binding sites, RNA polymerase uh, and DNA sensitivity. The Blueprint Project was quite similar in that it also used ChIP-seq um, assays and DNA sensitivity, um, but it used um, it used primary blood cells. So they looked at 20 different um, cell types um, from, uh, from blood, from blood samples. So looking at the hematopoietic stem cell lineage. For mouse, um, we take data from the ENCO project. So as well as looking at human cell lines, uh, the ENCO project also looked at eight cultured mouse cell lines uh, to generate the same data as well. So step one is to um, process the raw data from these major projects that have generated this data. So here you can see a very simplified example. So we have our genome running along the bottom in blue, uh, and then we have all of our evidence plotted along the genome uh, in what we call a signal 
So the signal is this tra these colored trace lines uh, that you can see moving along the genome. So if we take one uh, of these uh, one of these ev uh, experimental um, data types as an example, we can take transcription factor A, the red line here. So we can see here where the where the signal is low. This means that there are um, no sequences or few sequences aligning to this region in the genome. Then when we reach a specific point here, you can see the signal passes a threshold. So you can see that means that the ChIP-seq experiment uh, has generated reads that all map to this region in the genome here. Uh, and so the signal passes this threshold. Uh, and where the signal passes a threshold, we label this as a discrete region. So this is a peak. So this is what we call a peak, uh, and this is the signal. Uh, and we do this for all of the different evidence types, all of the experimental um, data types that were generated from these different projects. What we then do um, is we look for signatures um, where maybe two or three or more different evidence types overlap are co-located within the genome. So you can see here, for example, there's these five different evidence types that all ex uh, co are all co-located at this region in the genome. Then we look across the genome and we find all of the other regions where we have this exact same signature um, of evidence. Uh, and if there are regions within the genome that are known promoters, if this signature uh, is associated with a, a validated promoter sequence, then we can reasonably infer that every other region in the genome that has this exact signature is also a promoter region. Then we look for other signatures uh, and we also annotate those as regulatory features and we keep looking for different signatures of underlying data. The next step is a process called segmentation. So this is where we um, categorize the different regulatory features based on the underlying signature. So here you can see that we have perhaps, in this case, just three different categories. Um, so we have category A, which might be a promoter sequence, which is, which is characterized by this underlying signature. Then we have a different um, type of regulatory feature here. This might be an enhancer, uh, which is cat um, characterized by um, this signature. Uh, and perhaps here, this is a CTCF binding feature, which is, um, associated with this uh, particular evidence type, this signature. Step three is the final step in our regulatory build. This is to take a look at all of the different cell types. Um, the, the important thing to remember with this process, step one and step two, is that we do this for all of the different cell types that were covered um, in the ENCODE roadmap and blueprint epigenomics project where we have enough data. Uh, so what we do is we take all these cell types and we process them all independently. Um, you can see here we just have four as an example. Uh, and then we look at them all together to produce what we call a multi-cell feature. So we look at in 200 base pair blocks moving along the genome uh, and we ask in that position, is there a regulatory feature annotated? So in this case, the answer would be yes. Uh, and we keep moving along the genome asking the same question. So again, uh, in cell type one and four, we say yes. Uh, keep moving along asking the same question. So what you can see at the top here is that we're building what we call the multi-cell regulatory build. So this is the general regulatory build that is generated by looking at all of the cell types together. The final step then is to predict the activity uh, of these regulatory features in the different cell types. So you can see here, for example, this feature in red, um, there's, a, there's evidence for its activity in cell type one and four. You can see the underlying evidence that we used in annotating the feature initially. Um, whereas in cell type two and three, this feature is predicted to be inactive. Uh, and we do the same for all of the different features uh, and all of the different cell types. Uh, and then the final step, uh, step four, is to visualize this data in the browser where you can see the activity uh, of these regulatory features in different cell types and you can see the underlying data as well. And that's what we're going to explore in the demo. So the final thing that I wanted to mention, I think is the most important thing, is to, to highlight the limitation of the ensemble regulatory bill to you. So it's very important to remember that ensemble does not link regulatory features to genes. 
So Ensemble has a, uh, a gene build and Ensemble has a regulatory build, and these are two independent processes. So you can see the genes and the regulatory features aligned to the genome in the same view, but there is no direct association that Ensemble makes between the genes and the regulatory features. So if you want to link the regulatory features to the genes themselves, you have to make this inference for yourself. So there is cell line specific regulation data, there's tissue specific expression data, but it's up to you to make these inferences to experimentally validate the connection between any regulatory features and the genes that you are interested in. So what you'll see uh, in the last few slides is that we do hope to extend this uh, analysis, extend this data type uh, in the future where we can make these associations. But at the moment, this is not something that um, our predictive um, algorithms and, and uh, regulatory build can do. So there's some other regulatory resources in Ensemble. So you can, um, for human and mouse, you can also view uh, enhancers, the VISTA elements. Uh, sorry, you can view the VISTA elements, which are a set of enhancers. Uh, so we import those uh, from the VISTA. You can also view mRNA targets from Tarbase, which we import. Uh, and then for human, you can also view the transcription start sites and enhancers from the Phantom project. Uh, and we also import the GTEx EQTLs, which looks at genetic variation and their pattern uh, to gene expression. We also import uh, methylation data from the ENCO project uh, and we map microarray probes uh, to transcripts as well. So you can view all that data uh, through the Ensemble Genome Browser. In the future, we hope to extend the regulatory build to a number of different species. So um, the FANG project is aiming to generate um, very similar type sorts of data um, as the ENCODE, the Blueprint and the Roadmap Epigenomics Project have done uh, for agricultural species uh, and also the Zebrafish Genome Biology um, Consortium are aiming to develop uh, and generate the same sorts of data types for zebrafish cell lines as well. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, um, one of the future directions, one of the major projects that we have in Ensemble is to um, map the regulatory features to the genes uh, that they control the expression of. So, for example, we are going, we are hoping to use EQTL uh, and HiC data to link the regulatory regions to genes. So, in the demonstration, what we want to do is have a look at a region of uh, the genomic region where a gene of interest is found. So, we're going to have a look at a gene called BPTF. We're going to have a look at the regulatory features around our gene of interest, uh, and we want to try and find information uh, about those regulatory features. So I'm just going to jump out of the presentation, uh, and I'm going to move to the Ensemble Genome Browser. So from Ensemble, um, hopefully you're very familiar with the homepage now, we can just search for our gene of interest. So from the search bar on the homepage, I can type BPTF. Uh, and then click go. From the search results, I'm going to click on the link for the BPTF human gene. Uh, and this takes me to the gene tab. So you can see here we're currently in the gene tab. Um, to explore um, the regulatory features in the genomic region surrounding our gene, uh, we need to use the location tab. So we can click on location. So we can just toggle across to the location tab now. So if we scroll down, we can see this page is now loaded. So if we scroll down at the, to the bottom where we find the uh, region in detail view, we can see uh, our data is all arranged into these different tracks. So we have our context track, which represents our genome, as we spoke about in previous webinars. Then we have our genes track, where we see the different transcripts of the BPTF gene. Uh, but importantly, we also see this track here um, called regulatory build. So the regulatory build is the um, the general regulatory features that we annotate by looking at all of the different cell types combined. Uh, and you can see that we have these different features uh, in different colors. So if we scroll to the bottom, uh, we can see the regulation legend. So each of these colored features represents a, a type of regulatory feature. So the dark red is a promoter. So we can see a promoter here, for example. 
Uh, we have the salmon color uh, is a promoter flank. Uh, and we also have the yellow as a, uh, our enhancers. Uh, and then these turquoise colors, for example, these are CTCF binding features. So if we want to find out more information about a specific transcription, uh, about a specific promoter or regulatory feature, we can click on it. So even though Ensemble um, does not directly associate regulatory features to the genes themselves, there's a promoter that exists at the very five prime end uh, of our gene of interest. So even though there's not a direct association, it would be a good guess, a good starting point to perhaps begin investigating this promoter as a potential regulator of the BPTF gene expression. So what we can do is we click on the promoter that we're interested in uh, and that will open up a pop-up window. So here we have information uh, about this feature. We can see the stable ID, we can see it's a promoter and we can see the coordinates where the feature is located. Uh, to find out more information, we can click on the stable ID. Uh, and that brings us to the regulation tab. So what you can see now is that we are now in a regulation tab with information all about this regulatory feature. We've just landed on a summary page. So if we scroll down, we can begin to get some more information about this, uh, this promoter. So we can see here the regulatory build. This is our promoter of interest. Then we have data from a number of different projects. So we have data from the Phantom 5 project, we also have data from the tar-based project as well. So these are the mRNA targets, for example. Further down, we also have motif features. Um, so the, the black and gray blocks that you see in this motif feature section are the different transcription factor binding motifs that are either predicted or experimentally verified, verified in this um, region. So wherever you see a black feature in the motif feature, this is an experimentally validated transcription factor motif. So we can click on the feature itself. Uh, and in the pop-up window, you can see, again, we have a stable ID for the motif feature. We also can see the transcription factors that um, bind to this, this motif. Uh, and we can see that this was experimentally validated in GM12878 cells. If we click on the binding matrix link, so this actually is a link to view the binding matrix for this motif. It will open up a new um, tab in your internet browser. Uh, and you should be able to see uh, the binding matrix. Here we go. So this is the binding matrix of this specific motif that we were looking at before. So we can obviously see the, um, the frequency of the different bases observed uh, at the positions along this motif. Just going back to the Ensemble browser in my web, uh, in my web browser, the Ensemble um, genome browser in my web uh, browser. When we scroll down, at the very bottom, what we can find is a table that tells us the different cell types um, and their uh, and the activity of this feature in those cell types. So we can see uh, in six different cell types of 118 cell types in Ensemble, uh, this feature is active. In 98 cell types uh, within Ensemble, this feature is inactive. Uh, in one, it's poised. Uh, and in 13 cell types, it's actively repressed. So it's repressed in 13 cell types. Now, to get more information uh, about the underlying data um, for this regulatory feature, we can click on the link at the top here called Details by Cell Type. So when you're here um, in the details by cell type page, you'll find a very small amount of data that's uh, displayed by default, but we can add information uh, and data concerning different cell types using this blue button. So we need to click on configure cell slash tissue, this blue button here. And this will open up a pop-up window that allows us to select our tissues, uh, our cell types of interest um, and the experimental data that we're interested in seeing. So you can see, firstly, um, we have the option to select our tracks of interest. So firstly, we have two different, well, we have two different tabs. So firstly, we have our cell slash tissue. So you can use the search 
function here to search for your cell type of interest, but they're also arranged alphabetically uh, underneath here as well. So there's a number of different cell types and you can browse through them um, or you can search for them. I'm going to add just two different cell types. So I'm going to add the GM12878 cells, uh, and I'm also going to add the Whovec cells. So you can just click on your cell types of interest. So I'm going to add the GM12878s and the Whovec cells. Once you've selected your cell types of interest, you can move to the experiments tab, and you can begin selecting your uh, experiments of interest that you want, your experimental data that you want to view. So there are three different categories to explore, histone, open chromatin and transcription factors. So histone, you can again select specific histone modifications that you are interested in viewing, or you can click on the select all or the deselect all options here. Then you can move to open chromatin, here there's just one that you can select. Uh, one uh, evidence type you can select. And then for transcription factors, uh, again, you can find or you can browse the transcription factors by the alphabetical arrangement. So again, I've just turned on two different transcription factors that I might want to see as an example. But again, you can use the select all or deselect all functions to pick the exact data that you're interested in viewing. The next part of the uh, configuration is to click on configure track display. So you move on to step two in this um, uh, flow chart at the top. Uh, and here you can see the representation, the visualization uh, of these different evidence types in, different, in the two different cell types. So we have our two cell types. We're going to see the epigenomic activity. Uh, and you can also see the evidence that's available uh, for these cell types that will be displayed. So where we see this squiggle, you can see this is representing the signal. So we're going to see the signal uh, and the blocks represent the peaks. So for each evidence type in each cell type, we're going to be seeing both the signal and the peak. When you're happy, you can click on view tracks. So step three, uh, and this will close the pop-up window uh, and it will just reload the page with your data uh, that you've selected. So when we scroll down, we can see that we've now got more information on this page and it's divided by the two cell types that we were interested in. So you can see at the top here, we have GM12878 cells uh, and then further down, we have the Whovec cells. So when we're looking at the GM12878 cells, we can see a track called epigenome activity. So we can see that this promoter is colored red, which means that this feature is active in this cell type. Uh, and we can also see these black bars that represent the transcription factor um, binding motifs. Uh, and then underneath that, you can see both the signals and the peaks for the different evidence types that we selected uh, in the configuration panel. So we have the signal. You can see here, for example, in the plum color, we have a signal that passes a particular threshold. Uh, and then you can see the peak where that signal has increased above that threshold. So this is the discrete peak that relates to this evidence type, uh, which is the acetylation of lysine 27 on histone 3. So you can see here that this particular histone modification, post translation modification, was observed at this specific region in the genome. So all of these signals are aligned to the genome, obviously coinciding with the regulatory feature that we see here. Uh, and interestingly, all of these histone modifications uh, and obviously transcription factor binding that you can see here, these are all associated with an uh, activation of transcription. When we look at the Whovec cells, we can see the epigenome activity. The feature is colored in gray, which means that this feature in the Whovec cells is actively repressed. So this is a repressed feature in Whovec cells. Uh, and underneath, we can see uh, the reason for that uh, annotation. So we have, again, these different signals for the different evidence types. So we can see perhaps here in this um, lilac color, we can see the signal passing a particular threshold. Uh, and here we annotate here uh, the peak, which is the monomethylation of lysine 4 on histone 3. So again, it's the same principle. We look to see where these signals pass a particular threshold. And these are the peaks um, that we've annotated. Now, if, interestingly, uh, 
when we look at these different histone modifications that have been observed uh, in this region in the HUVEC cells, we find that these post-translational histone modifications are associated with uh, transcriptional downregulation. So that's why this feature is, is labeled as um, actively repressed in HUVEC cells. Good. Okay. So the final thing that I want to show you uh, is back in the location tab. So if we scroll, uh, if we toggle back to location, uh, if we scroll to the top of the page and click on the location tab, this is where we started our demo. Um, but what we can also do um, while the page loads uh, is we can explore the different tracks that we can add to the location tab that display regulation data. So if we click on configure this page, the blue button on the left hand side underneath the menu, you'll find this pop up window um, where you can explore the different tracks that you can add. So from the menu on the left hand side, there's a category called regulation. So I'm going to click on regulation now. So you can see that there's one track that was already turned on, the regulatory build. We, we looked at that earlier, um, but there are a number of other tracks containing uh, regulation data as well. So there's an option here called configure features by cell slash tissue. So that actually turns on the data in a very similar way to what we saw in the regulation tab. So you can actually add uh, tracks displaying that data that we saw in the regulation tab for different cell types using the option here. But you can also see that there's other data types to add as well. So there's um, DNA methylation data from the ENCODE project. So a number of different cell types here have the reduced representation by sulfite sequencing. Uh, and I'm just going to turn on the methylation. I want to visualize the methylation pattern in GERCAT cells. So to turn the track on, we just click on the box. From the menu on the left hand side, you can see that there are some other regulatory data types available. So I'm going to click on other regulatory regions. And again, you can see that there is some other data that you can view as well. So you've got data from the Phantom 5 project, Tarbase, Vista, uh, the MOTI features as well. Um, but interestingly, I wanted to also point out to you the CRISPR-Cas9 track as well. So what this track will show you um, actually is the NGG PAM motifs uh, that exist across a region in the genome. So it's going to be a track that helps you to um, design a CRISPR experiment by predicting the guide RNA sequences that you might need to, to generate uh, in designing a CRISPR experiment. So again, we can turn this track on as well. So we click the box and we can select normal as the format. Uh, and then when we're happy, we can save and close. Again, this page is just reloading with the, the, the new data tracks that I just added. So when I scroll down, you can see that these tracks have now been added. So we have, um, just as we saw before the regulatory build, we have our features here in this track. Uh, and then just underneath, we have a track called RRBS. So this is the reduced representation by sulfite sequencing for, for GERCAT cells. So this presents the, the methylation pattern observed uh, for GERCAT cells. And um, so these colored um, bands represent the different methylation states. Uh, so if we scroll down, you can see the methylation legend here. So uh, yellow and green colors represent uh, a, a lower percentage of methylated reads, whereas the dark blue colors you can see here and here, for example, these represent um, a much higher proportion of methylated reads in this region. You can also see that the, the final track underneath here is called the CRISPR, -Cas, the CRISPR SP Cas9. Uh, and it actually says that this track has too many features uh, to show at this scale. So it's asking us to zoom in. So what I can do, if I scroll back up to the top of the image, I can scroll along the genome just to make sure that I can see the whole of this promoter sequence. Uh, and then I can draw a box just around my promoter of interest. So this is obviously around the five prime end of the BPTF gene. So I draw my box and click jump to region. Uh, and obviously now I've zoomed in, here is my promoter of interest, and I can now see the features within the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, CRISPR track. Uh, 
So this is um, the NGG PAM motifs on the forward strand. Uh, and okay, this uh, again on the reverse strand, the NGG PAM motifs, there are too many to display on the reverse strand, but we could just um, view these just by zooming in even further. So what you can do is you can use these features um, to, to help you generate um, the guide RNAs for your CRISPR, for designing your CRISPR experiment. So the, the, the bold lines at the end of each block represent the NGG PAM motifs, uh, and then the empty block represents uh, the 15 base pairs upstream um, that will form your guide RNA. So it's helping you to, to design your experiment where you can obviously identify the exact position where you need to um, design your, your RNA for, your guide RNA for. Good, so that brings me to the end of the demonstration.